There is a phenomenon on YouTube where a YouTube creator gets online and asks their subscribers for questions, and then they answer the questions. It's always appeared very lazy to me because it feels like a lazy video, and I think it is, but I'm a lazy guy, so I thought I'd do one of these things. So, so a few days ago, I put a call out for questions, and I'm going to answer those questions now, so let's go ahead and jump right in. Now, I should say that I did not go through and put names to these. I'm just going to put the question out there. So if you ask this question, you're not going to get credit for it. But you probably know who you are anyways. There is just a few. The first question that I got asked was, where do you stand on the topic of extraterrestrials? And my answer to this question is, I think that it would be very arrogant of humankind to think that we're the only ones out there. Of all the billions of stars and hundreds of millions of planets or how many ever there are, to think that we're the only one seems a bit arrogant, but it's also possible that we're the only ones. It's also possible that we're not the only ones. I think it's more likely that we're not, and that we just haven't, you know, stumbled across any other life forms yet. But then again, we haven't explored that much of space. I mean, relatively, we've just a very small smidge of space that we've actually been, you know, able to observe either in person or you know, through technology. So I think that we're a long ways away from being able to actually discover whether or not there are true extraterrestrials out there, but I think that there probably are, yeah. The second question I got asked was, do you think Linux is a viable Windows replacement for the average PC user? And my response to this would be to ask another question, what is the average PC user? Because if you if you consider yourself like the person who asked this question, you consider yourself an average PC user, then yes, somebody who can seek out a Linux channel and ask this question is, if you consider that an average PC user, then yes, w Linux is a viable Windows replacement. If you're considering somebody who's more of a luddite, someone who doesn't have any interest in technology at all, I would say no, because the vast majority of those people don't know how to burn an ISO. And that's the first stumbling block you're always going to get to when installing Linux. Now, now there are obviously exceptions to that rule because many of those people have family members that can install Linux for them. And that's the scenario I'm in with my father. He has Ubuntu on, running on his laptop. It's extended the life of his laptop for uh, at least another year and it's still going. So I think that in that scenario... We're not really considering those people users of Linux because they don't care what they're using. They just want to play solitaire and do jigsaw puzzles. That's what my dad does. So so to answer the question, I think it could be for people who are technologically advanced enough to install Linux and to be curious enough to learn about it. For the most part, most people aren't like that, so they just want to use their PCs for as a tool and those people probably aren't going to be happy with Linux or even know that it exists. So the next question I got asked was, do you still think the Edge is the best browser? And I don't know where I said the Edge was the best browser. I said I was switching to Edge because Firefox has problems. And I said that a couple weeks ago. And I was on Edge for a week and a half or so before it erased all my data and I had to switch back to Firefox. So... Do I think Edge is the best browser? No, I don't think Edge is the best browser. I don't think there is a best, a best browser. I don't know why my eye twitched when I said that, but that's true. Uh, I think that they all have severe flaws. Uh, Chrome, Chrome, Google Chrome, has the flaw of being from Google. Chromium has a flaw of not having anything to sync with because they had to rip out the Google parts. Uh, Vivaldi has the flaw of being slow and proprietary. Brave has the flaw of being, well, brave. I mean, <laughs> weird advertising, uh, a weird fixation on cryptocurrency, uh, and overall just kind of general shadiness. I mean, at least in terms of their uh, PR abilities. Uh, so that's brave. Uh, Edge has problems that it's, you know, from Microsoft, obviously, but also uh, it seems to be in a perpetual beta for some reason on Linux. So that's a big problem. Uh, Firefox doesn't render some websites properly and has a political stance that's out of the woke era. So 
uh, they have their own problems too. So, and, and I'm using Qt Browser right now. It has its own problems. So there, I don't think there is a perfect browser out there. Uh, you, that's why so many people, when I asked what browser to use, answered with two browsers. So, the, so they use two different browsers, probably on the same operating system. So I'm one of those people who I really don't want to have to use two browsers, but I have a feeling that I'm going to end up doing two browsers because I really, really like Qt Browser. I switched to Qt Browser yesterday. And I'm really enjoying it, man. It's like really good. But there are some things that are just, they don't work. Like Tumblr won't work for whatever reason in Cute Browser at all. Like it stops all the key bindings from working when you visit Tumblr. And while well, that's not a big deal, I visit Tumblr once a day. Uh, there are other websites that I'm sure I'm going to discover that are exactly the same. So for those websites, I'll have to end up using Firefox. So I'll be one of those people who use two browsers as well. So that's my answer is there's not a best browser and Edge definitely wouldn't be it if there was a best browser. The next question is, would you consider doing a review of the Raspberry Pi? Yes, I would if I had a Raspberry Pi. I don't have one. Uh, it's not that I don't have money to buy one because they're really cheap. It's just that I haven't yet. You know, eventually I'll get around to it. Uh, I would love to create my own NAS using a Raspberry Pi. I think that would be a fun project. The problem is buying hard drive space right now, it seems a little bit overly expensive. So that's going to have to wait into the future. The, the next question I got was, how long have you been using Linux? Now, this is an interesting question because it has kind of two answers. So I first discovered Linux in about 2002-ish, maybe 2001. And I was working at Little Caesars, which is a nationwide pizza joint here in the United States, for those of you who don't know. I was working at Little Caesars. It was my first job ever. I was in high school. And one of the guys I worked with, his name was Seth, he handed me a CDRW with OpenSUSE on it. That was my first experience with Linux. And I installed that on my gateway PC that I'd just gotten in the year 2000. It was my first real computer at home. And it cost like that, that computer cost like $4,000 and came in like 25 boxes. I shit you not. I remember the day that that thing comes. I mean, if you don't know about, if, for, for you youngins out there, and you don't remember Gateway. Gateway came in these boxes that had uh, cow spots on them because the cow was their mascot. And the UPS driver came and pulled them back into our driveway and was here for about 20 minutes unloading boxes because it came in that many boxes. It was the dumbest thing ever. I mean, the keyboard came separately because, I mean, it was a huge-ass keyboard. It had an accessory package. It had the, the gigantic tower, which I swear was at least two feet tall. I must you, and this is the year 2000. Uh, anyways... Uh, in 2001, when I got that CD or that CDRW with OpenSUSE on it, I brought it home, installed Linux on that computer, and I used it for a little while. But at that point, I wasn't as technologically uh, interested in anything, really. I was a high schooler who wanted to play video games. And at that point, <laughs> there weren't any games for Linux outside of, like, you know, Solitaire and a few things like that. I mean, there were a few, but I didn't know how to get them. Uh, you know, I wasn't as technologically adept as I am right now. So I didn't last very long on Linux at that point. Now, in 2009, uh, me and two of my friends started a technology podcast. <laughs> it's had many uh, titles since, you know, we started. but And slowly it has transitioned into us reviewing movies and stuff like that. And just three guys hanging out. But in... 2009 we did that and we've been friends ever since we keep doing a podcast every once in a while but in 2017 one of those guys and i decided we were going to start a linux podcast i don't remember why we decided to do it though like i don't remember why like i didn't use linux i was a windows user at that point but for whatever reason i decided i wanted to use linux and i wanted to start a linux podcast so ricky and i did we started a Linux podcast. We he he had been using Linux for quite a while at that point. He works in IT, so he you know knew a lot more about Linux than I did. And so we just started to start the podcast. And at that point, I decided I was switching to Linux full time. Now I kept the Windows partition, but I just decided to start to switch to Linux and just use it full time. And the first distro I used was Solus Budgie. And I loved Budgie. It was fantastic. Uh, but the software availability, even back then, was not so great. So 
uh, I ended up hopping a lot. Like, I mean, that's what you do when you first start using Linux. I hopped a lot. Uh, and that c- kept on for a couple of years. So I've been using Linux full time since 2017 when we started the podcast. Uh, and some of those early episodes are still up online in the feed if you want to go back and listen to them if you're really all that interested. They're uh, not great podcasts. I'm just going to th- put that out there. But they're there if you want to want want to listen to them. Uh, so yeah, 2017 is the answer to the question. The very long winded answer to that question. <laughs> okay, why do people hate System D, and would you prefer? Would you ever consider running a system without System D? So I had this from a couple people. The reason why people don't like System B, D is because they think it does too much. People get obsessed with the Unix philosophy, the whole do one thing and do one thing well. So. They don't like System D because System D does a whole bunch of stuff. It's not just an init system; it does a just a ton of stuff, and they don't like that. That's the reason why they don't like System D. They think it's bloated. Uh, I think those people are fools, uh, mainly because they don't understand that what System D actually is is an umbrella name for many different programs. I mean, yes, we all call all that stuff System D, but really, it's just uh, it's just many programs that lie under the System D name. They all follow the Unix philosophy just fine. They just happen to all have the same name. Uh, so I don't think there's a problem with System D, and I think the people who don't like System D are actually just asking themselves to do more work. Uh, because when you, you, you can switch to something to a different init system, but you still have to find tools for all the other stuff, all the little stuff that System D does. So you have to find things uh, to do, like I said, to do all those little things, and that just, I mean. All you're doing is recreating System D, you know, without the name. <laughs> so you're not actually gaining anything when you switch to something like OpenRC or Run It or whatever, because you still had to find other tools to do the things that System D does. So personally, would I consider running a, a distro without System D for trial, maybe, maybe for a video or something like that? But would I want to switch to something without System D just because I hate System D? No, uh, I think System D is great. Uh, I don't care if it's bloated. I think that it does what it does, and it does what it does well, if that makes sense. Anyways, that's my answer to that question. Uh, My next question is one that I get pretty much on every single video. I think I get this question every single video, every single live stream uh, from people, well, you know who you are. When will you try Gen 2 again? And my answer to the question is, I will try Gen 2 again when I get to my Patreon goal that states I'll try Gen 2 again, which I think I set at $350. So I set that arbitrarily high because I don't expect to ever get there. And that means I'll never have to try Gen 2 again. So that's the answer to that question. Uh, Stop bugging me. Eventually, if I get to that point, I'll try Gen 2. If not, I'll stick on Arch. Anyways, Arco versus Arch is the next question. Uh, The answer to this question is easy. Uh, Arco is the best answer to this question. Uh, I use Arco all the time. Now, there's nothing wrong with Arch. I like Arch-based distros. I just happen to think that the community surrounding Arco is a little bit better, a little bit friendlier. I also think that the tools that Arco provides is just fantastic. And I'm also a lazy person, so maintaining Arco feels just a little bit easier. So that's the answer to that question. Next one is Firefox or Brave? Firefox. Uh, I don't like Brave. Uh... I have a stupid complaint against Brave. Really, I don't care about the cryptocurrency stuff or the, the ad stuff, whatever. You can turn that stuff off. But when you download something in Brave, there's a, this huge-ass downloads bar that comes up at the bottom. This is a feature in Chrome, too, but it's smaller in Chrome. In Brave, whatever, they made it huge. And you can't get rid of it until you dismiss it. And you can't dis, you can't turn it off. It's the stupidest design decision ever. And I know they, like I said, I know they inherited it from Chrome. But why they made it bigger, I don't know. It's dumb. I hate it. That's why I don't want to use Brave. And it's, I guess, a stupid reason not to use a, a browser, but I just can't get past it. Uh, the next one, Alacrity or Kitty. Alacrity is the uh, choice I would make there. There's nothing wrong with Kitty. I just have used Alacrity uh, more often. I also like the auto-update feature of Alacrity better than Kitty. Uh, all right, so Snap versus Flatpak. Neither. It's called the AUR, bro. Uh, next one, uh, we're kind of in a lightning round here. How do you believe Firefox will end up is the next question. And the answer to this question could get me going for a long time. But I think that eventually Mozilla will have to fire everybody 
and just be a browser company. And they may not even be a company at that point. I think that it's possible that Firefox will just get spun off kind of like Thunderbird did uh, to the point where they're kind of supported by Mozilla, but it's very much a community project. And at that point, more people will probably actually use it because they'll be more interested in it and instead of it being a, a corporate back project. And I, the reason why I say this is because eventually Mozilla is going to run out of that $400 million they get from Google. And they're going to have to stop paying their CEOs and uh, COOs and stuff like that millions and millions of dollars to literally make a browser. And then all these other small projects that don't make any money or any sense. Eventually that's going to happen and they're going to have to figure out something to do with Firefox don't know do I think Firefox will go away no like I said I think either it will get spun off or it will get forked or something uh, to the point where it's just community supported at that point it will probably be very very small I mean I, I, I mean it's very very small now but there's still hundreds of thousands if not millions of people who use Firefox but at this point I think when it does get spun off it'll probably be much much smaller than that the next one question comes from, I, I didn't write the names of these down, but I guarantee I know who, who wrote this one in. Uh, Peter asks, uh, do you believe in the Church of Emacs? The answer to that question is no, it's pronounced Vim. Uh, the, and the last one is uh, another one coming back to the the whole Edge fiasco that I uh, started a, a week or so ago. And why Edge and not Chromium? The answer to this question is very interesting. I think that Edge is actually better than Chromium for many reasons. So for one, the design of Edge is better. You can get vertical tabs. You can have this feature where it will actually put tabs to sleep so that they take it, take it right out of memory. It doesn't take up a whole bunch of memory. I love that feature. Um, it also has built-in functionality for finding you coupons and such like that, which is just, I mean, I, you can get every time I say these features somebody's out there like well you can get extensions for that like yes you can get extensions for that for Firefox and Chromium and all that stuff but that means you're adding another piece of software from another vendor that you don't necessarily trust I mean it's just a random Joe Schmo off the internet to install into your browser where you enter passwords and credit card information all the time and these extensions and stuff like that aren't supported or vetted by Firefox or Google or Microsoft, they're just put into a store. Anybody can do it. Uh, I mean, they may get scanned for viruses or whatever, but how do you know that none of those extensions are stealing your, in your information? I'd much rather Microsoft steal my information, which I know they do, uh, and sell that to, to advertisers than some random guy off the internet steal my credit card information and steal my identity and, and run up, you know, thousands of dollars in credit card bills. Microsoft at least isn't going to do all that far. So that's the reason why I chose Edge instead of the Chromium because I like some of the features in Edge that I I couldn't get in Chromium without adding all these very insecure extensions. Now, all that being said, I love extensions. There's a f many extensions in Firefox that I use, uh, but I try to limit them to extensions coming from vendors that I can at least somewhat trust. Uh, I do ad admit that one of the things I miss in Cute Browser the most is ad blocking because ad blocking in Cute Browser is terrible. And I also like the easy functionality of having my Bitwarden stuff built right into the browser. So I have to actually use the Bitwarden client separately and it's kind of an extra layer of extraction. So that's one of the things that I don't like about Cute Browser. So that is it for the questions that I had this time. If you have a question you'd like to ask me, you can either leave it in the comments of this video below, and I will answer them next month when I do another Q&A video, or you can email me. You can find the email uh, on my About page on Linux, on the on YouTube, or you can tweet them to me at the LinuxCast on Twitter. You can support me on Patreon at patreon.com slash LinuxCast. Before I go, I'd like to take a moment to thank my current patrons. Devon Chris, East Coast Web, Gen 2 is Fun 2, Marcus Meglin, Sven Jackson, Knife and Tool, Joshua Lee. Thank you for your support, Joshua. Mitchell, Mr. Fox, Arch Center, American Camp. Thanks, everybody, for watching. I'll see you next time. <laughs>